All right, and we are live with the uh, Behind the Shot Image Critique Show. Before we officially start, we're just going to have some fun and talk and, and see who's all there. Of course, I got Don with me. I got Ant with me. So everybody in the chat, you can say hi to, to these guys. And uh, gentlemen, how are you guys? I'm well, um, good morning to you guys. Yes, that's right. What time, is it? what time is it for you right now? That's about 8 a.m. And just to check, because we had the thing where you didn't hear me mute before. If I mute right now, you hear Go on. Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks good. for getting that sorted out, Steve. Appreciate yeah, you that. got it. Uh, we got a <laughs> lot of people here in the chat right now. We got James from right around the corner from me, Canyon Lake. Uh, who else? We got Casey Broda's in here. Uh, Casey, we Some have an image of yours in here tonight. Uh, Stephen Wilson, <laughs> Terry Wagner. We've got somebody talking about dead bodies already. We knew that would happen. <laughs> How did that become a thing? I I, I don't even I, know. Yeah. Uh, Kilo <laughs> Hotel is here. Alexander's here. Uh, Robin Chun almost chose one of yours. I don't remember if I did, but I almost chose one of your shots. Uh, uh, Gary Monroe is is Mr. Body is here. Um, who else? Don, you answered Alexander. Is that Russian that you just wrote? Zdrave uh, is hello in Bulgarian. Oh, interesting. Uh Everyone I mean, there's too. lots of variations of hello, but, um, and hello in Russian would be Zdrasvite, I believe. I didn't know that you spoke Russian, but it makes sense. You're learning Bulgarian, I'm guessing, pretty wow. well now. I'm, I'm learning Bulgarian as best I can. I, I only know a few words in Russian here and there. Uh, that's, okay. that's not on my radar, but, you know, you pick up a couple of words here and there. Also, Mario Immersion, is here, who man. I actually uh, met in Vegas. Uh Drake is here. Awesome. Vancouver Island. So welcome. So we're going to do this thing. We've got nine images tonight. And uh, I think that it is a good time to go ahead and get started. A couple things to let you know about. But first of all, this is the behind the shot image critiques. Hi, everybody. Welcome to behind the shot image critique number 26. We've been doing this more than two full years now. Don and I started it alone, and then we started bringing guest hosts in, and one of my favorite guest hosts is here tonight, a friend of both of ours, so I'll bring him on in just a second. A couple things, though, that I do want to just kind of let you know about in advance. First of all, if you are watching on YouTube, please sure be sure to head down, hit subscribe, hit the bell, hit the like button, all of that stuff if you like what we're doing. The normal podcast, this is not it. This is only available on YouTube, but the normal podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts in either an audio-only format or if your distribution source, your, your podcasting app of choice supports video, then you can always get the video version of it in your podcast app too, or you can get it here on uh, YouTube. I also want to say thank you to my friends over at DBE Store. Uh, we've got high-def video because of them, so visit dbestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. And uh, I love having HD, it makes it so much easier. But for now, let's bring our host in. First of all, I've got Don Komarechka, the regular co-host. Don, how are you? I'm very well. Uh, greetings from the coast of the Black Sea. Coast of the Black Sea, Bulgaria. And then our guest host, Mr. Ant Pruitt. How are you? Unbelievable, sir. How you be? I'm doing good. It's always good to see you. I'm getting those white lines on you guys. It's going to drive me nuts all night long. So, Ant Pruitt, we need <laughs> to talk about you for a second because uh -oh. for those that don't know Ant, uh, Ant is a host over at twit.tv, but also has his own YouTube channel. So real quick, tell us what shows you host over on Twit. Uh, you're still doing hands-on photography, but you're on some other ones as well. And tell people where they can find mm -hmm. you on YouTube. Well, first and foremost, the primary show on the Twit Network is my show, Hands On Photography, is twit.tv slash hop. Um, but I also co-host This Week in Google, which is a big tech discussion. Uh, you know, the big tech companies, we just talk about all of them, not necessarily Google. And then every now and then I'll have some reviews of um, consumer electronics on our Tech Break feed. Sounds good. And Mr. Don, where can people find you these days? Well, my website is still doncom.ca, uh, although I have registered the .bg domain name too, so you can check that out. It just brings you to the same website. Um, 
And uh, Steve, uh, you and me are going to be uh, recording an episode of Photo Geek Weekly. Uh, maybe tomorrow. I'm getting my COVID booster shot later today, so who knows what shape I'll be in. Um, but within the Boy. week, uh, Photo Geek Weekly will be returning to the airwaves. And I thank you, sir, for being my first guest uh, back on that program. I, I am so excited for that because still, by the way, if there's anybody watching this that doesn't subscribe to Photo Geek Weekly or hands-on photography, please do so. These two are two of the best in the business, and I love these podcasts. I listen to them uh, myself. It's funny because you're you're getting your booster shot. I lost, I was telling Ant in the green room before we went live, I lost a crown today. I'm at Del Taco. I'm eating a churro, and suddenly I went, oh my God, there's metal in the churro. No, it wasn't. It was metal from my mouth. I lost a crown. So if, I, if I'm stumbling today, it's because I'm sensitive um, in, many, in many different ways. Uh, so, all right, that's what we got. Don, do you want to tell people that that have not done this before how they get in on the critique shows? Sure. So we sent you the critique show. I mean, obviously you're watching this on YouTube, but the images are posted to Flickr. We have a Flickr group and you can search Flickr for behind the shot and you'll find us there. Just look for the similar logo um, and uh, and join the community, really interact and engage, post your images, talk to other photographers about their images, ask questions, offer your own mini critiques if you want there. But if you want to be a part of um, of this program right here that we're on, just add a little tag, add BTS critique, uh, all one word, to your photos. Uh, and that'll kind of give us the, the the nod that you would like your photos to be possibly selected for the show. We only choose nine per episode, so we can't get to them all. But at least you kind of throw your hat into the ring. And, uh, and hopefully at some point we will get to your image and discuss it here with me, Steve, and whatever our guest is for that episode. And that all happens on Flickr. We chose Flickr because they really do a great job at respect the the images that are uploading there's very little compression you can see them full screen uh, it's in my opinion the best platform for viewing images online and uh, the community elements there are great albeit somewhat underused for Flickr as a whole so let's try to change that with our behind the shot group yeah and just to kind of reiterate this they have to be you have to post the image into the group and use the Flickr tag, BTS Critique. And I'm going to say this every single show. Our goal here for all three of us, we're not here to rip on people. Somebody uh, was commenting on Twitter. They were looking for places to get critiqued. And they said that they were going to Reddit and they could be brutal there. We try not to be brutal, but we will be brutally honest. But That's our goal here key. is not to rip somebody. I mean, we're not going to sugarcoat it. But at the same time, our goal is to help you elevate your photography to from whatever level you're at, the next level. And getting an outside opinion sometimes, in my opinion at least, on your images is one of the best ways, the strongest ways for you to very, very quickly improve your photography. And what I'm going to tell you again, every single show, Scott Kelby wrote a fantastic blog post over at scottkelby.com, what to expect from a photo critique. If you haven't read that, Go over to scottkelby.com or just Google what to expect from a photo critique Scott Kelby, and it'll bring that up. Trust me, read it. When, when you get a critique, a photo critique requires something from the people like us that are critiquing it, but it also requires something from you, right? I mean, you have to have the right frame of mind, be looking for something that, you know, is, is realistic in the critique. So head on over there and hopefully that'll get you started. Before we uh, jump into the images, anything else you guys want to share or say? No, I just um, want to just uh, echo what you're saying. And I appreciate how you do this show, uh, you know, periodically because it, it is pretty, pretty raw. You know, you guys go through the shots and you, you don't really hold anything back, but you're not trying to draw blood, <laughs> right. you know, um, and I do get a sense that the community is learning from those discussions and this with you two and whomever the other guests may be that week, everybody has the same approach. And I think that's very, very helpful. Yeah. I, it's somebody I, with a sack of doorknobs, not a knife. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> well said. Oh, I was wondering how long it was yeah. going to take it's, you, Steve. This uh, is so. Have I told you the radio station story? What happened to you? The radio. This is how OCD I am. Back in the days of CDs, we had a wall of CDs behind us at the radio station. So Steve goes over and he takes a CD and he slides it into the wall, and it 
goes in crooked. Oh. And I walked back to the board and I literally, I'm saying to myself out loud, it'll be fine. Just leave it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It lasted five minutes and I had to go straight in the CD. So yes, I admit it. I am a little, <laughs> little bit OCD. All right, let's jump into these. The first image, Ant, you are our guest. So glad that you're here. Spanning the centuries is the image. What say you? All right. Um... I, I saw this image and saw the title, and so that gives me a direct comparison to work with right out the gate. Um, I didn't necessarily think the title uh, fits this image, but it's not a bad image. So I'm just throwing the title out the, out the door in this scenario and just going to consider it a file name, if you will. So I'm going through this image, and my eyes sort of bounce all over the place with this one. Uh, I'm looking at all of the gazillion arches back there in the back because I love architecture and just the, the science that goes into getting these beautiful arches to stay there just fascinates me. I'm looking at the tonality here. But then I start to wonder, like, okay, what exactly is the subject here? Um, is the subject the arches in the back? Um, or is the subject the center of the frame? Um, lower lower center of the frame, the person with the umbrella. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather the, the photographer pick out a subject and try to highlight it a little bit. If it's going to be that back row of arches, let's do a little bit of um, uh, dodging to bring it out a little bit more. Or if it's going to be the person with the umbrella, uh, put a little radio filter on them to bring them out just a touch more. Because other than that, it just seems a little busy. And I just sort of had a bit of bouncing around all over the frame trying to figure out where to go. Uh, the cropping uh, at the top, that I don't really care for that at the top where it cuts off in the upper right third, um, sort of loses its balance a little bit. So I'm not sure the focal length, where is the focal length on here? The focal length was 42 mil maybe get a little bit wider on that focal length so you don't have to it says 14 mil thing. and uh 14 millimeter i mean it was taken with a 14 to 24 millimeter lens but oh, it was on the widest uh, uh, oh, end of the that yeah side. oh okay so that's when you have to step back even more but yeah that's 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 my two cents on it. i do love the tonality on this though it's not like black and white it's not really sepia but it's 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 interesting uh don you want to go next so I agree with what a lot of uh, uh, Ant's comments are. The, the image feels busy uh, to me. Uh, at, at the end of the day, I keep coming back to, the, to that comment. And, and how would you necessarily solve that? Uh, but to go back to the beginning of uh, Ant's comment, I mean, th that's a Roman aqueduct that we're seeing running through. That's like over 2,000 years old. And juxtaposed with the modern cars running underneath it, a phenomenon that I've never understood. I've seen this in Turkey as well where you got this beautiful antique multi-thousand year old architecture you should be preserving but you need to run a highway somewhere so you just run it underneath this aqueduct and one accident could cause this entire thing to come tumbling down um mm -hmm. Uh, anyhow, uh, the, uh, the the idea uh, of juxtaposing the old with the new, I, I think, is is a valuable sentiment. But how could you tell it with less information? Because photography is a subtractive art, and I think, okay, you know, this is already shot at f five, uh, and you're kind of limited in your depth of field with the equipment that you've got using a lens that's great for street photography and street photography usually takes it all in. Um, mm -hmm. but that can be too much to eat at once in an image like this. Uh, so I, I I've been bouncing around the idea of how do we selectively possibly dodge and burn certain areas. And I can see some efforts to that have been done in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, things have been muted and the brightness has been darkened down so that that bottom left corner is less distracting to the rest of the frame. And so I can see efforts towards that end have been put into play which is excellent. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the main subject of the frame here is to me, the person under the umbrella and the umbrella held really low. So like, you know, it's, it's like, okay, is there enough room for a head underneath there? Uh, and maybe their head <laughs> is kind of pointed down and, but you can't see that. And so that's, it's really front and center to me. Uh, a thought that I had 
that, you know, I don't use one often. And in fact, I don't own one. I've, I've rented one on occasion is this would be a great place to experiment with a tilt shift lens because you could shift your focal plane such that you could get some of the arches, but you could have some of the stuff behind the arches out of focus. And you could have some of the stuff on the left and the right of the subject here also out of focus while the main subject in the middle of the frame was still relatively sharp. And so that could be an interesting way of just playing with the focal plane itself, uh, even within uh, the confines of, yeah, you, know, you might not be shooting this at f2.8, maybe it's at a four or five or something, right. um, but you could still get a little bit closer to your subject. Um, that would inherently decrease your depth of field and then play that focal, uh, focal plane uh, to your benefit side by side. And I think that that could be a, a huge benefit for an image like this and not something that street photographers would typically go to as a tool, but uh, keep that in mind that it, it's useful at times. So the tilt shift idea to me wins the internet right now. That's a, that to me is a great idea. I am surprised that you didn't say that there needs to be a subject on the aqueduct, like Spider-Man crawling on it, but, <laughs> but I'll go with that. So a couple of things, what I like about the image was it's a very cool idea and look, and we've seen this before the, the juxtaposition of new and old together. It's a, it's cool with the Roman act. It's just wild to me to have a Roman aqueduct going through the middle of a town that's got modern cars and modern umbrellas and semi-modern buildings. Um, that's just wild to me, but there's a number of things I think could make this image stronger. I'm going to start with the crop. What Ant said about the top, I totally agree. I wish that that where it dropped off at the at the left side, that it disappeared a little lower and that the top side where it went out of frame was a little bit farther to the right. I'd like more sky. Even if it's just that you lay down on the ground next to that wall to get a little bit more vertical up on it. I think it would make it better. More room at the top and for that matter, more room at the bottom below their feet. I think they're too tight to the bottom. On the right hand side, the left side I don't mind and I actually like that you got your vertical right on those arches, on the walls next to the yeah. arches at the far left. Nice job. But on yeah. the right, I wish you hadn't chopped the window and the door in the middle. If that was whole, I think it would make the image stronger. Those are semi-minor. Here's where, to me, the image is really struggling. It's in two areas. I'm going to start with the halos, which Gary mentioned the halos actually in the uh, chat as well. You've done something to the clouds here where you have a halo on almost every single arch. And that is really obvious. And again, the idea of post-processing is that we don't see your work. If we see it, something went wrong. So those halos, mm -hmm. you have two options. Process it in a way that it's just not obvious or process it like this if you love this. And then do what my buddy Dustin Jack does. You go in pixel by pixel if you have to, to fix those halos. There is no substitute for clean, good processing. But then, and this is the last one for me, I agree with Ant. This is, this is what I love about doing these shows because I agree with Ant that I like the, I like the, the treatment of the image, but the tonality of the, of the image is falling flat for me. Mm -hmm. You've got almost nothing. Like if you were to pull up levels in Photoshop, which goes from zero to 255, you have almost no whites above 238. Mm -hmm. I pulled it into Photoshop and looked. You need a little pop for me. Now, granted, I like contrast. This is subjective. I, I agree. But if you were to just pull up levels and drop the whites to about 238, 235, Maybe even open up the mids a little teeny bit. So instead of one, take it to like 1.1 or something like that. I think you're going to find this image will pop off the page a lot better. Um, so that's pretty much it for this one. And again, we've got a couple of images, uh, a couple of uh, comments on this one. Uh, Gary said, nice image. Halos around the arches are distracting. Wonder if the photographer got on the ground beside the wall, looked up and had the umbrella guy bigger uh, in front of an arch, like centered in an arch. That could actually be kind of cool. Sounds so familiar. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Alexander said, for me, crop everything to the left of the street wall, maybe a square image of just the downhill street leading to the arches. Guys, what do you think of that one? That could work. I mean, again, yeah. it's to that goal of uh, the image needing some subtraction uh, and anything to afford that, I, I think would be helpful. 
Uh, so yeah, that, that could work. I, I hate to, to go to, Oh, crop it. Uh, as, as a recommendation, because that's always kind of the easiest answer, uh, for right. uh, an image critique. Oh, crop this off, crop that off. And, and yeah, you know, that, that, that works well, and, man, and there's no it question works about for it. For but... So many scenarios though, you know, <laughs> but there's yeah, other I... ways, especially when you can think of a way in camera that could possibly improve things. That's where I go first. Well, and here's 100%. the other thing for me. I don't believe when I critique an image, I don't believe it's my job to tell the maker of that image, what the image should have been right? They wanted this wide. They wanted this aqueduct. I don't believe it's my job to tell them, oh, you should have only shot the street. Quite often an image has like one image could be cropped into four great images. Sometimes it's not a good image hole and it needs to be cropped. But in general, look, if this is the story you're trying to tell, I think all the things that the three of us and some of the people in the chat said, I think in the long run, those comments are going to help you get a a stronger image of your choice. So let's go to image number two. And this one is called Glow with the Flow. Don, you want to get us started? And I'm going to do something weird on this one. So this image has a black background, but on Flickr, when you maximize the, the, the image, it's on a black background. So you can't really tell where the end of this image is. So I'm going to do this so that everybody can kind of see what the actual image composition is as far as the crop. Uh, Don, yeah, I, and I like the way that they've framed the the, the black uh, background around. And yes, you, you do lose that when you see it full. Um, but that that's a good amount of negative space around a frame that is very simplistic. And uh, you know, as we were just talking about photography being a subtractive art, this is about as minimalistic as you can get um, without having nothing to look at. You've got a subject and an accent. The subject, of course, uh, being the uh, the baby praying mantis, or not praying mantis, some type of a, a different type of mantis. And, uh, and this little fluffy grass bit, um, and it looks like it's climbing up to find a perch where it might, uh, you know, uh, find some prey or something. It's probably been posed that way because a mantis likely wouldn't be climbing up this particular stock, but push that aside. Uh, mm -hmm. cause they're really easy subjects to manipulate. You can put a mantis anywhere you want. You just pick them up and you move them around. Uh, in fact, I've got a, I discovered a praying mantis Uthica, which is their little egg casings on one of our fruit trees in our backyard. And I'm going to put that in a little mesh cage and wait for them to hatch. And then I'm going to be able to play around with similar images to this, um, <laughs> cause they're a lot of fun to create. Now, uh, the lighting in this, you've got backlighting, obviously you can see the outer rim of the fluffy bit um, of, of grass there is brighter than the inner area. Uh, and so that gives a really nice accent. It's the nice hair light, but that's not the only light that's illuminating the frame. And that's important that you also have light that is filling in those shadows in the foreground. Um, and, and while the hair light is bright, it's not terribly distracting. And the fill light really does lift things out of the shadows while still maintaining a very dark background. So from a, a portrait perspective. And I'm not a portrait photographer. If anything, I'm an insect portrait photographer, which is sort of what this is. Um, you've got a great separation between the background and the foreground. The question for me is whether or not black is the best choice. You know, it might very well be, and I'm not saying that it doesn't work being black, but could there have been a different color or accent or opportunity to play around with that background in this case, to have it be a gradient, something other than black, something out of focus that accents and frames the subject in a way that provides some level of context, even if it's so far out of focus that it doesn't provide any tangible detail. Um, that could be the next sort of ponderance where I would just kind of sit back and look at this image and think, okay, you know, this works and I like it. Uh, and you know, I would frame this, but is there a way for me to improve this further? And with macro photography, often it's pondering what the background can do for the subject, um, as that final je ne sais quoi. You know, Gary said in the chat, very cool shot. Don't know if it's video, but it looks like the insect is out of, out of focus, but the fuzz is in focus and no, on, on, on my end, the the mantis is very, very sharp. It's actually really nicely done. I love the angle. I love the, the, the angle of attack of the camera. I love the angle that you have on the light, the fill light, the rim light for the, the plant structure. The thing for me though is, I, while I love backlight like this, right? And again, you you filled in tastefully. I think you may maybe to my taste, and this is a, a subjective thing, to my taste, I think the mantis is filled in a little too much. 
Uh, I think it's a little too hot. I think that could be because of what Dawn said. It's so contrasty against the black. I think if you had something else back there, I wouldn't mind how bright the mantis is. But the rim light on that plant structure and through those hairs, to me, is too, har too hot. It's also too harsh. I would love to see you diffuse both of those. If they are already diffused, I'd love to see you throw one extra layer of diffusion on it. That's pretty much me. Now, let's get to the crop, which is the last thing I'm going to say on this. Uh, my only issue with the crop on this, I'm going to pull it out of the full screen so that you can see where it is. It's vertical black. It's slightly left so that the combination of the plant and the mantis together are centered, kind of. It, it doesn't feel like it because the plant obviously is heavy left. I would love that whole thing to be shifted to like almost, not quite, almost the right third. Give that mantis room to look into. It just feels like it was just dropped into the middle of a black square. And I'd like to feel a little bit more composition out of it. Uh, Ant, what do you got? I agree with most of the stuff that the, the two of you said. Um, let's talk about the lighting on the uh, piece of foliage, whatever this is, <laughs> whatever this little piece of grass is. I love the lighting. I love the the, the thought process that went into getting this rim lighting um, and really did bring out the details. Um, yeah, I think the little fuzzies are just a touch hot or maybe they're just a touch too sharp. I can't really decide on that, um, but I but I still like it overall. But my definite nitpick is the additional separation from the background. Yes, it's a black background, but I agree with Don 100%. And I, I thought of him immediately when this shot came up, uh, because if you look at, look at his latest book, you know, you're going to see a lot of different ideas of having some things in the background to just sort of help enhance the image. And if you even look at my screen right now, there is a purple light sitting behind me because it's 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 a night and day difference for me to have that little LED turned on behind me versus turned off because when it's turned off it's just black back there but that purple light just gives me a little bit more depth and it makes it just a little bit more interesting same thing can go for here i don't care if it's just take a tiny little flashlight or something just just a little bit of light to streak through there just a little tiny gradient to streak through there and it would be hmm. Much better. And Steve's got Good purple stuff. behind him too. I, I got to get purple lighting here. I got to yes, join, uh, join the you, club. We, we, you didn't get the memo. You know, it's interesting because I just interviewed a guy for the regular podcast today, Sam Abel, a, can a Canon Explorer of Light, 23 years as a Nat Geo photographer. And he made an interesting comment, and that was he builds his image from the back up. So get the, get the, the canvas first and then place the mm -hmm. subject on that canvas. And there is no back here. Um, I right. think it's cool. I think it's fine artish, but I do think in many ways it would be, I don't want to use the word stronger, but I'm going to, I'm going to anyway. I think it would be a stronger image if there was even just a different solid color back there. And for those of you that are thinking that it looks a little fuzzy, it's a 1080p HD signal. But, you know, obviously if you go to Flickr and look at the image, It'll look a little bit yeah, sharper. It's YouTube compression going yeah, on because this image is really sharp. <laughs> um, next image up. This is Reddish Egret. And I will start on this one with just saying this. I love everything about this image. This image is awesome. This image is fantastic to me. The balance that you've got in the colors to the background, to the water, to the moment that you got, to the depth of field that you've got, when I was picking images today for this, before I sent them to, to Don and Ant, and I was looking at different images, and, and I'll be honest, I picked this one up and I went, I don't know that I can critique this. I don't know that I have anything to say, but anything good. And, and when I pick images, I, I generally try and pick images that there's something that I think people would have an opinion on that would make the image stronger. How, yeah, and Ant does. However, uh, at the same time, there is something to be said for an image that can be an example to people. We see yeah. so many bird photographs, like Scott Kelby used to do this thing I loved, where people would submit a, a flower photo to him and he would go, uh, okay, so 
Flowers are beautiful in nature. So if you're going to put one in front of me that's a picture, it better be really beautiful. And yeah. it would suggest that people go to 500px or Flickr or something like that and look at really good flower pictures. I think I wanted to put this in kind of for that. You've got the bird on the left looking camera right into open space, nose room, as they call it. The water droplets coming off of the beak. Absolutely amazing. It shows the beak was just down in the water and he pulled up and turned his head really quick. The foot is up, which is awesome. The eye is in focus. The horizon line doesn't intersect anything that matters. It goes through the lower part of the solid body, but it doesn't cut the legs off where it is. The depth of field to me is almost spot on. This is really to me an example. So when I say almost spot on, here's the one thing I will say I wish was a little better, a little different. The hairs on the head, there's an old saying when you photograph pets like dogs, nose, nose to ear should be in focus. I really wish that the back of those hairs were in focus. Everything else I'm good with, but I wish the back of those hairs were in focus. Ant, you want to go next? First off, I'm going to just give a, a clap for this one from the technical standpoint. If you look at the gear that's used there with these 1.4X teleconverter on a 600 mil lens, um, yeah, you that takes some skill to be able to pull this off to get it as, as crispy as it is. Personally, I think it could still be a little more sharp uh, around the eye. And as you mentioned, with those uh, head, the rear, those head feathers should be a little bit more sharper. And the only other thing that I would do here, I would give this thing some more daggum saturation and vibrance because this is just a beautiful scene, a beautiful moment that you captured in time within these, what is it, one eight hundredth of a second? No, sixteen hundredth oh, of a second. Oh, yeah, sixteen hundredth. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, unbelievable. So let's let's really blow this thing up punch that color up and and let it let it shine because the bird is already looking good so now let's make the bird and the photo look good yeah i i agree and, and don really quick before you go i did want to throw this one up on the last shot the mantis shot uh casey said that she thought the lighting on the grass overpowered the mantis and that's what i was talking about with the backlight i think that you needed to control that a little bit and keep those uh. highlights recoverable um but on the shot that we're talking about now, Mario said these are all of them. Uh, Mario said these shots are inspiring. I must say this is another good one. So, Don, what do you say on this one? It is certainly another good one. Um, you know, I, I might uh, be the uh, the opposing force here on the um, uh, on, on the hair at the back of the bird's head, because part of it is blurry because of motion blur. Oh, and you could quick, imagine somebody quick, just let me interrupt you, Terry. Don said hair, too. Don didn't say feathers yeah, yeah. too. Yeah, I'm. I'm. It's. I'm thinking about this, about this as a person. It's looking like hair. Somebody so, said that in the uh, chat that I said hair, and I'm like, I'm an idiot. No, uh, it's okay. So anyhow, it's as if a model just kind of flung their head, and their head has stopped, but their hair is still moving. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I, I think that's a really cool uh, sort of. Uh, exploration of that sort of movement and that character. And if you had that nice and crisp, it would have less of a sense of movement. That's a good In point. fact, um, okay. I, I would typically be shooting birds at, uh, you know, uh, one one thousandth of a second or faster, just like this. Um, and it's impossible to predict when you're going to get that kind of moment. You can't control your subject. If the shutter speed was half of what it was, and everything else was solid except you were able to double that amount of motion, I think the image would have been a stronger image for that because it would have added more character to the subject. Um, I, there's not much else that I could uh, nitpick about this other than the the one leg that is up is intersecting with the one that's still in the water just ever so slightly. A little bit of separation there would be helpful. I, again, you don't have control over this aside no from choosing which frame uh, of the sequence that you have that is best. And maybe there is one that doesn't have that same connection. Uh, and sort of like Steve's OCD, mine has to do with blemishes and images that could easily be fixed. And right near the left edge of the frame, just below the surface of the, the water horizon line, there is a dust spot on your lens. Oh, and, dang it. 
and and please <laughs> please remove that because I can't unsee it once I once I've noticed yeah, it. Uh, nice. The one blemish on an otherwise amazing image. Just g give it that border patrol. Check the out of focus areas. There is also what could be uh, an insect or a water droplet up in the green area, right at the very left edge of the frame. There's just kind of a light dot there as well. Uh, an image like this deserves that extra treatment of going around and cleaning up the stuff that doesn't belong. Okay, yeah. so now I cannot unsee that sensor yeah. spot. <laughs> Sorry, man. I will never unsee the sensor done. spot. Oh my God. Uh, Gary said, awesome shot, maybe a slight vignette, uh, more gradient to reduce expo uh, exposure slightly from the bottom. Uh, the water in the bottom slightly distracting. I'm not sure I agree with that one. Evelyn said, I would not, or I would add more saturation and vi vibrance too, so that the colors look a little bit more complementary. And yet mm -hmm. Alexander said, would not add saturation because the pale look is more natural. And that was kind of my feeling is uh -huh. I think, I think that it is very, I, I, I picture Moose Peterson looking at this and what would Moose say? What would Moose do? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't think he would go too saturated on it, but you know, you never know. Uh, Ant, we're going to have you take the next image. And this one is called Ivan and Amelia. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure what to think on this one because I didn't want to be offensive. Um, from a post-processing standpoint, I'll just start with that because that's the first thing that comes out in my head. This man's skin is is absolutely beautiful in post. I love the key lighting on it where it's hitting just all of the right spots and really showing the different contours of his um, musculature, you know, his, his delts. I can literally see all three heads of his deltoids there uh, and his biceps and his chest and it, it's the striations and his pecs. Just, that's beautifully done. I'm not so sure what I think about the green tint, uh, almost a bit of a Hulk green showing up on him. I, I thought um, my monitor needed calibration uh, I when I saw that, that as well. And so I I'm colorblind and, and still went, another... I, I, I still looked at it and went, maybe, maybe it's because I'm colorblind, but it's not, right? It's there. It's there. I yeah, looked at I it get, on my I laptop. I looked at it on the computer here and I was like, okay, so that's there on purpose. That that threw me off a little bit, but beyond that, I do enjoy images like this because they're just, uh, you know, we're parents, the three of us, we're parents, and we've been here, so it's gonna it, it tugs at my heart. So they're already gonna get some points from that, just for that. Um, but yeah, just just that green tint on there, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. But everything else, I totally dig. I I, I dig the. The little grin on his face and just his 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 eyes are locked in on the baby's eyes. You know that's that's parent connection right there. I I, I love that. Don, you want to go? So um, I mean, my my daughter is I think the youngest of all of our children. So I'm the closest in history to this this moment myself. Um, and it's a wonderful moment when you're holding uh, you know your 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 baby and. When it's that small, I mean, they're the most adorable creatures in the world, even though they only cry, eat and poop, uh, you know, all is forgiven holding them in your arms. Um, and, and so I, I kind of have that connection here and I like it. Uh, you know, it's, it's love and, and the image is showing that. And sometimes that's a hard thing to show. So we've got that. That's fantastic. Um, Compositionally, uh, I think that a couple of things could have been done by the photographer to improve uh, the, the image. Again, the lighting, as Ant said, is, is spot on. I, I don't think I would change anything there. Um, but the, uh, the the baby's head is right next to the edge of the frame. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd give a little bit more space there just because, you know, you it creates a high contrast zone right at the edge of the frame. And instead of looking at the baby's face, I'm looking at the back of the baby's head because that's where there's contrast in a curve. And we're just drawn to that as, as visual creatures. So remove that draw by giving a little bit of extra space. Um, you can see that of course, that the baby's skin is fairer than uh, what I assume to be the father's. And, and that really shows itself around the baby's foot, intersecting right next to the father's arm. Uh, and so again, if, if the photographer had moved just a little bit to the left, 
then the foot would have been completely sort of encapsulated with the arm in behind it and would have had some better framing there. And that could have also given a bit of uh, extra space uh, to, to the head. Um, you know, if you are going to, and this image does look like it has had some post-processing just to uh, give a bit of polish to the image, um, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, every image deserves, um, mm -hmm. then also pay attention to some of the stuff in the background, um, right behind uh, the man's rear pocket. There's a little white spot and there's a, a, a black streak, vertical streak there, just uh, whatever that is a blemish on the backdrop that you're using. If you're going to, you know, frame a beautiful image like this, please go ahead. Just like I mentioned with the previous one, clean up all that stuff that doesn't matter. That's possibly going to distract me and focus on what really matters in the image, the interaction between these two people. So everything they said, and I don't have a lot more, I am going to reiterate some of it because I think it's important, but everything they said is perfect. Uh, this is beautiful from a subject matter point of view, a dad and his daughter looking down the eye contact between them, the, the, the juxtaposition of what Ant said, the muscly dad, and yet the very gentle hold that that dad is doing to the child. Tinder. Right? You've got the muscly dad and the, the, the fragile child, but also the tender holding that the dad is doing. I just love that. The crop is, is off. Way too close to Amelia's head on the right-hand side, I would argue left-hand side to his shoulder as well. I don't mind the space at the top, but I'd like the same as the space at the top on the left, and maybe even a little bit more than that on the right-hand side. I'd even go down, and here's why I'd go down. You don't have to, but I don't like that his front pocket, I'm only seeing the top of it in a zipper tab. I'd like to have that pocket, quote unquote, establish itself a little bit before you cut it off, as it were. Um, so, a little bit of crop change on, on all the sides. I want to talk about the lighting though for a minute. You manage to get lighting here that does show muscle structure. That's great. But I would argue you got, you got too much fill. So the key light is clearly camera right. But you've got too much fill on the left. You almost could have used negative fill on the left perhaps. Or maybe you had a reflector or something back there. I think you needed to tone that down a little bit. I think you almost took what is cool light that showed the muscle structure, and then you almost flattened it a little bit. And so maybe like, put a flag on camera left. Yeah, maybe a flag camera left. Maybe it's a reflection on off of something. Um, there's a lot of hot spots on his face, the bridge side of his nose, above his eyebrow, his lip. I'd clean up all of that. And I want to touch on the processing because you have to be aware of skin texture. Here, obviously, the dad is older. He's got skin texture. The baby has none. That's really cool. But if you look right above the dad's right eye, it almost looks like somebody took a thumbprint and put it on his forehead. But the rest uh -huh. of his head is smooth. I'm not sure if you did texture. I'm not sure what you did texture or sharpening wise, but I would be careful of, of that type of, of treatment on this the black line behind his pants and the little white spot behind his pants, I'd clean that up. And last but not least is the posing. This shot has so much potential. Take the extra time. Tie a knot on his shorts or, or sweatpants clean. Make a really clean knot. He's looking down at the child, I love that, but I can't see his eyes. And that's really what I wanna see is the dad's eyes and the happiness in the dad's eyes. So have his head up a little bit so that I can see the eyes and just have him look down with just his eyes, not his head movement. That way I'd get a little catch light in the eyes and be able to see the eyes. And last but not least is the hands. While he is holding the baby so gently, the hand behind the head I love, the hand under the legs, I would love those fingers to be a little more gentle, put them together, less, less basketball palming and and move those fingers a little bit together and and also burn down that foot. I totally agree with Don on on the uh, on the foot thing. Uh, next Good image. Point. And this one will be for Don. This is Minneapolis geometry and let me say up front, I am dying to know what you think about this. Um, so uh, our architecture is always an interesting thing because it's a study of lines and shapes and uh, oftentimes people with with architectural imagery they try to embrace the entirety of it rather than take a small section of it like we're seeing here. Uh, and in, in the cases where people are trying to see everything, uh, you really lose the patterns. 
Uh, and in this case, we're truly embracing the patterns of all of these different lines and shapes. And, and the fact that you've got uh, a significant number of parallel lines and then lines that are going perpendicular, but they're all on an angle. It honestly reminds me, and I've done some work in the area of photographing microprocessor circuitry. Circuits. Uh, and it, it just <laughs> definitely reminds me of <laughs> of something on, on an entirely different scale it reminds me I of didn't circuits even and see that until just now. Oh my god, you're right. And and so I, as soon as I saw the image, it immediately I snapped the two together and uh, and that was powerful for me. And and I and I, I kind of wish that um that m- maybe there was some way to accentuate that idea more, but it, it hit me perfectly fine. Um, within any patterns in imagery, uh, one of the things that is always helpful is something that breaks the pattern. Say you've got like a white picket fence, but one of the uh, the panels is painted red or black or some different color. I mean, it's going to draw you into that particular component here. So we have a few things that break the pattern, but they're just things that are on people's balconies. Um, most of them nondescript. I can see a plant on one, um, but it would be really fun uh, if... Uh, and I'm not sure how many of these, uh, if, if I'm seeing plants and balconies, these could be apartments um, uh, or you know a condo building or something like that. Um, then maybe there is something um, in a different section of this pattern that has something that is maybe colorful or that breaks the pattern a little bit more precisely. Say if it was around Christmas time, somebody having you know some garland or some lights or something on one of those balconies, just one thing that very obviously breaks the pattern of everything else rather than some um, inconsequential little light blobs here and there that are obviously something just stuck out on a balcony that I can't really tell what it is in order to give myself a visual anchor point. Because when you have an abstract image like this, that visual anchor point becomes far more powerful, even if it isn't a subject itself, because the subject is effectively the architecture, but something for your eyes to, to lock onto work around the image and then come back to, I think the image is, is sort of missing that one element, but I love it otherwise. Uh, so I'll go next on this one. And, you know, it, it's funny because it, until you, you mentioned, you know, photographing a chip, I didn't see that. And it goes to the fact that I don't see these type of images in real life. I wish I did. I walk around with people that are friends of mine that stop and photograph something. And I'm like, what, what are they seeing? I, I don't see anything. <laughs> and then they process it. And I'm like, oh my God, man, that's brilliant and genius. And I'm blind. That's how I feel about these type of shots. Usually I don't see ab- abstract shapes in real life when I'm on the street, but I love them as fine art. It's some of my favorite stuff is fine art. This to me from normal life is a really cool abstract art. But when I see abstract with like this, it's, it's random patterns, but they're not. They're somewhat repeating in their angle and in their 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 cutaway. So I want those those patterns to continue. So if you look, for example, the far right side, the balcony, the blue railing disappears right at the edge of the frame. But the balcony in the middle, you see a little bit of the concrete go to the right. The balcony at the top, you see a little bit of the concrete go to the right. In my head, why don't I see a little bit of concrete going to the right on that bottom balcony? I, I need that kind of symmetry to have that repeating shape continue. I notice those things, same as at the bottom. If you look dead center at the bottom, there's only a little sliver of balcony of that one at the bottom sticking up out of the bottom. Give me a little more of that. It's the little things just to continue, to, to let the, the shapes not only establish themselves, but cleanly terminate right? Termination matters. It feels like the concrete underneath these balconies is, I don't think it's over sharpening. Maybe it's over texture. Uh, It feels a little pushed too far. I think you could go a little less on that, but that's, you know, really minute. I'd print this and I'd hang it myself. Ant, what do you got? Um, I'm only going to disagree with you regarding the the right side of the, the frame there with the, the continuity that you're looking for. Right. See, seeing this as abstract, I'm not expecting a lot of continuity, okay. um, but I, I love this idea and it's pretty cool that 
I can now say, hey, I, I thought of something the same way Don Kamareska did. Because when I saw this, the first thing that came to my mind was this looks like some chip that the engineers at Twit was working on one day and took a mi macro photo of. That's the first thing I thought of. Um, well, and, I and like I, I have, I have chips just sitting here because, uh, I, well, why wouldn't I? Um, and uh, so I was, <laughs> I was photographing this thing. Not an MP4. Th th this is this is a Pentium Pro, so this is circa 1995 or, or something. Um, but uh, it's it's built on a uh, on a 500 nanometer uh, process technology, and now we're at a five nanometer process yeah, technology. We're at five now. So crazy, right? <laughs> uh, so from 1995 to, to to now, I mean, things have changed quite a bit. But I was was just photographing this the other day, which is why it immediately came into my mind. So all geeks think alike, I guess, except Steve. You recently have had one of those shots on your Instagram, right? I did. I put it up recently. All right. pull, 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 yeah, but, uh, actually, I'm, I may pull that up and share that while we're doing this. Uh, and so another anyway, thing go, about go ahead, this Anne. image, though. Another thing about this image that I enjoyed is, Yes, you, you, you have your beef with the continuity of it, but I love how in the lower left corner versus the upper right corner, he, he lined this up properly to terminate into those corners, the, the way the railing is. I, I, I think that's a little fine detail that most people would, would miss. Um, I love this. I, I, yeah, it may be slightly over textured, but I would still print it. I would still hang it on my wall today. Uh, David, you crushed this, man. And here is, I'm going to throw this up really quick here. Let me just slide this into the frame. Uh, this is Don's shot. There it is. Of the Pentium, <laughs> the macro shot. I just love that. It's it's love such that. a fun thing to photograph. Uh, how did you, and, how did you, you, know, you like got, this? So that is lit with a number of LED flashlights because basically you're getting optical interference from the silicon dye. Um, and the angle of incident is very important to the, to the angle of reflection up to the camera, sort of like a hologram where if you see things in the right angle, you get some crazy colors on the wrong angle, you, you see nothing. Um, so uh, with the uh, platypod gooseneck arms, I've got a, a flashlight attached to it and I just kind of move it around until I get something good. Okay, lock that in place. Then I get another one. Uh, and then I have that accent in maybe a different part of the chip. I move it around until I get something good. And okay, lock that in place. Um, and because these are photographed on fairly extreme angles, you know, with macro shots, um, you you have a very shallow depth of field when you're shooting it at, at an extreme. So they're focus stacked using an automatic focusing rail uh, to, uh, I think it was around 150 shots or so to combine together to, to get the entire thing crisp. Uh, tip to tip, which thankfully for architecture shots, you don't need to go through all of that craziness. Um, you can use your natural <laughs> light and, and your depth of field right. is going to be more than sufficient. And, and so there's fewer challenges for this type of thing. Um, but the, the, the look and feel is reminiscent for sure. All right. So before we get into the next shot and yes, Casey, your shot is actually going to be next. Uh, let's visit with our guest really quick. Ant. Uh, for those who weren't here at the beginning or jumped to the middle or anything, where can people find you? Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, your blog, uh, Twitter. You're all over the place doing everything. Where can people find you? <laughs> I'm doing my best trying to be all over the place. Uh, check out my show, Hands-On Photography, on the Twit Network. It's twit.tv slash H-O-P for hands-on photography, where I do a lot of different tips and tricks and interviews with great photographers like these two gentlemen here to just, you know, share some tips and tricks for the photography community that's just getting started or that intermediate person that's just trying to sharpen their skills. But I'm also over on social medias. I am ant underscore Pruitt on Instagram as well as on Twitter. I have a lot of fun on Twitter as I just randomly say stuff. Twitter's totally is still my favorite, but you're also, uh... <laughs> Find him on YouTube. Go subscribe on YouTube. Ant Pruitt on YouTube. Yep. Ant Pru Pruitt. YouTube.com slash Ant Pruitt. Yeah, there you go. And Don, what about you, my friend? What are you doing aside from the fact that you and I, hopefully in the next day or so, depending on, on COVID Booster, are going to do a Photo Geek Weekly? And uh, for those that don't know Photo Geek Weekly, explain it. So normally it's a, an hour, hour and a half um, show. 
podcast that uh, we, we typically pick three or four stories from the weekly news cycle. It's going to be really hard to pick the stories for the next episode because I could make a 10 hour long uh, uh, you know, sort of comeback episode, uh, as, uh, as I'm now set up here in Bulgaria. But, um, the, the stories that I pick from the news are new tech that's on the market now new patents that have been filed, um, lawsuits or ethical dilemmas and just anything that's really geeky about photography that we can sink our teeth into, uh, and think about the possibilities, the dilemmas, the ramifications and so on, uh, how it affects our lives as photographers. Um, or maybe just the cutting edge of technology and what that means for science and, uh, and, and how we can view the world around us in a different and, and more interesting way. So Photo Geek Weekly uh, is going to be coming back. And thank you all for listening to that. And here in Bulgaria, things are getting set up quite nicely. Uh, we're again, I'm in, still in the process of setting up my studio, so uh, things aren't perfect yet. But uh, by the time we do another one of these critique shows, it probably should be. Um, I am coming to you from a small village of around 135 people, about 10 minutes away from the Black Sea, uh, on a cellular internet connection. But those things are pretty fast out here. Um, we live in uh, a very rural area, but 25 minutes from a very big city. Um, and it's really nice. It's really peaceful. Uh, and this is exactly the kind of lifestyle, not just for stepping outside and breathing fresh air, um, whenever we so choose, but also, uh, I'm really excited to just kind of have a day where, all right, I got nothing to do. Let's pick up the camera and let's experiment with absolutely no regard for getting something useful just to tinker and have fun. So over the next weeks and months, uh, hopefully people will see some interesting um, just experimental stuff that might not really hit the mark on exactly what I'm after, but you'll be along for the journey. And so you can follow me on all of my social media handles. And we'll probably be talking about some of those adventures over on Photo Geek Weekly as well. And it's photogeekweekly.com. And then your book, I understand, is there's still copies available at B&H Photo. Yep, b &H and Adorama, if that's your persuasion. Uh, okay. Support either of those. Uh, and if you're in Canada uh, and you don't have a copy yet, the camera store out of Calgary does have some stock on it as well. All three of those uh, vendors, great folks, but when they're out, they're out. I don't have an ability to restock them. So if you haven't gotten a copy of Macro Photography, the universe at, uh, at our feet, um, now might be your last chance to get a physical edition of it. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Again, I so love doing this. So Don, it is uh, wonderful to be doing these again with you. I love seeing you. And Ant, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, tonight, I should say. My for pleasure. Us. My pleasure. Uh, next image up. I'll go first on this one. It's Boeing Creek Waterfall. And this, to me, like I don't do landscape photography myself. Um, I mean, I have, but I'm not a landscape photographer by any means. But this is a beautiful place. And I... It, it's the old saying, look, if you want to take beautiful pictures, you got to start by going to a beautiful place. You went to an absolutely <laughs> beautiful place. I love everything that's in the shot. The, the log, the waterfall coming at kind of like the side of the log or over another log. The angle where you got down low, although I, I do kind of wish, you, I, I like that you got down low, but I do kind of wish I could see a little pool behind the log so I'm, there's kind of a conflict in me there. I want to I wanna have a little overhead so that I can see what's behind it, but that's just me. Great place for a slow shutter, which you did here. I like that. But here's what I'd like to see. First of all, the processing. This feels really too cool to me. I think a different white balance would make this image leap off of the screen to me. Ant doesn't agree with me. I can see him shaking his head. But to me, the white balance feels <laughs> off. The shadows are gone. Like there is no detail in those bushes at the left on the waterline. There is no detail under that log and that shouldn't be. I know my eye would see details under there. There's no way that this light is that dark and that harsh right now. So I think that you need to recover those shadows or expose slightly differently for that. Even if you need to put an ND filter on to get your shutter speed, whatever it is. Uh, remove down in the bottom corner, bottom right side, there's a rock. And right next to that, there's a green piece of plant. I would actually remove that. It's sitting on its own is a little odd to me. Um, it also appears that about midway up, I don't know if I can 
find it with the telestrator, but well, I went too high. Sorry about that. <laughs> right about right there, or actually, no, below that too. Right below that. Right about there. There is something in the water there too. It might just be a white rock, but it is a little distracting to me, so I might pull that down a little bit. Other than that, nice job, beautiful water. Compositionally, I like that the log and everything is up higher. Uh, let's let's see what Ant says. I was looking on my Flickr to see if I could find something in my library because I used to shoot uh, images like this all the time. Where I used to live in Charlotte, North Carolina, I had a river at about 400 meters from my front yard. And I would walk down to the river all the time just because if you go down there every day, you're going to get 365 different shots. It's, it's just right. that easy. Um, and when I looked at this, it just made me think about sh being back in Carolina and the, the, the white balance on this, it just makes total sense to me. I, I love that it's a little bit cooler. And Steve, you know my, my style of photography. It's usually yeah. a little bit on the cooler side and yeah. a little moody. Um, so I, I, I totally love that. I love the, the vibrance on it. I do not like the um, lack of shadow detail. I'm not saying just go super duper HDR um, because I don't always like the the ultimate high dynamic range in an image. Sometimes I do want some dark shadows, but I don't think it helps in this image. Um, if you look at the left of the waterfall and it's just totally black right there, um, it just doesn't fit because we know that that's earth there and earth has texture, earth has details. Let's get that to peek through just a little bit. Same for those logs over there on the right of the waterfall. There's there's texture there that that would really just add some more detail, um, add some more um, information to the shot. So lift those shadows up just a, a, a couple notches and uh, you're going to be good to go. Um, shutter speed was I don't even think you needed an ND because I think you shot yeah one fourth of a second. So, yeah, you could still slow this down to maybe one second and be fine and get the same type of effect and be able to have those shadows a little bit pulled up in, in camera instead of having to fight it in post. Yeah. And for me, for me, it's really the shadows are blocked up. And I meant to say this and Drake mentioned it in the chat. And I meant to say this and didn't is that stick to the left of the waterfall. I would do something with that stick to the left of the waterfall. Uh, Don, what do you got? Yeah. yeah, so I, I agree with a lot of uh, uh, what, what you've said about, about the color temperature. I'll start there. Uh, and, and Gary kind of hinted at this as well. He says that um, the shot almost looks like it's scanned from film. And, and Gary hits on the same point that I am. It's not the color temperature in terms of, uh, you know, uh, blue to uh, yellow. It's the color tint from green to magenta. And it's a little bit too far on the magenta side of things. I don't mind it being cool, but there's a slight purple cast to the image that you would typically get from scanning film and, 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 and so that can be corrected. Uh, and, and so I, I would agree with that, but I do like the coolness of it, especially because you've got the juxtaposition of the fallen, uh, autumn leaves, which can still warm up the image, even though the water feels cool. And so I like that combination mm -hmm. to, to me, I am looking at the image in terms of what ingredients are needed. Um, the warmth of the leaves. I think that's a necessary component, the waterfall itself, obviously you'd need that in the frame. Um, and some of the interactions between the rocks just be beneath the waterfall. And that's it. Those are the three things that I need. So what don't I need? Well, I, I don't need the trees way going into the background in the upper uh, right-hand corner. And I don't need the foreground, uh, where things sort of fall out of focus because it can be a little bit distracting. As Steve had mentioned, some of those foreground elements, if they were sharp, they might be useful, but out of focus, they don't have the same attraction. So I would have and, taken and, the picture and, from and a different angle. Point, actually, they're actually a distraction. This is true. Right. Um, so they're, uh, they're a detriment to the image. So I would have gotten a little bit further up the stream uh, where you've got two prominent rocks in the water in front of the waterfall, one on, on the right-hand side, the way the camera is, and one right in front of the falls itself. Frame those leading into the waterfall and have the background being the leaves in, in behind, and all of those elements fall into proper alignment. And it also gets rid of all of the distractions that I don't need in the frame. As soon as I identify what the 
ingredients that I need are, then it's easier for me to remove the things that I don't need by knowing how to arrange the things that I do. Um, this was shot at ISO 400 at one fourth of a second. I typically shoot waterfall images at a one second exposure. It just gives a little bit more flow to some of the slower moving water and you'd increase your dynamic range, giving you a few more options in post-processing as a result. Even though you shot this on a Canon RP, uh, the dynamic range is great there. You know, as soon as you start bringing your ISO up, your dynamic range starts to go down. So you'd have a little bit of flexibility there. And furthermore, about that stick in the background, you know, I'm of two minds of this. If it's something that's very transient and might be there one day and not the next, like that little branch that a you know a gust of wind could knock it into the water and carry it on down, I don't mind going around a frame like this and moving some of those sticks or twigs that are really temporary ingredients out of the way for the image or removing them in post. Um, I, if I've got fall colors, I have also been known, and I'm, I'll fully admit it, to carefully placing a nice fall colored leaf on on one of those rocky outcrops, exactly where it would be a beautiful splash of color within the frame. And I've even come across some scenes in nature where I know somebody was there before me that did exactly that same thing. And I just took advantage mm -hmm. of what they had set up before. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's wrong because you're imparting some level of artistic intent to the image, just as you would be rearranging things by changing your camera angle or your focal length and, and what have you. Yes, it's staged. Moving your models okay. here get over that because a lot of things are staged in the world around us, even if it is a natural environment. I'm not redirecting the flow of water. I'm just carefully placing a leaf the way that it could have possibly naturally right. fallen. Um, and so play around with those ideas and those different angles. And, and by the way, if you've been to this waterfall once, go again. And again, the next week, the week after, go in the winter time, go in the spring when all oh, the flow is always going to be different. I've gone to the same waterfall a dozen times and photographed a dozen uniquely different images. I, I'll often walk away the first time I go to a, a waterfall or a new landscape uh, lo location with what I call a documentary shot. It depicts what it is. I got to get that out of my system. When it's out of my system, I then get a lot more creative the next time I go back to the exact same location. So uh, the iterative effect of going back again and again will inherently uh, increase your creative thoughts and the process of taking a few more risks and maybe not getting the right shot, but experimenting. And uh, you need that for these types of images. I, I, I'm not saying that I dislike this image. I do really like it, but there's certain elements that can be improved compositionally the next time you're out in the same spot. Yeah, and actually I'm going to I'm going to jump on what you just said because that's such a good point. You know, when I when I have a job, photography job, I might take my safe shots first, the shots I know I need, the shot I know the client's going to love and the client's going to want. I'll knock those out and then I'll experiment. Well, that documentary shot serves that purpose. Go one time, get a documentary shot. Get the safe shot that's needed. And then once you've got that, play and play on different days. Some days, maybe there's clouds, maybe there's not. And it may be that one day you take it with the clouds and go, you know what, it's just the wrong clouds. Just go back all the time. But <laughs> overall, I will say, love the shot. Very, very nice. So uh, thank you very much for participating. Next one up, uh, Ant, if you wanna go first on this one, it's Amber Mist. Wow, Amber Mist, this, this one is, so creative and beautifully done um my only nitpick because i stared at this for quite a while i couldn't really think of much that i wanted to to do to this one i love the processing i love the the, the pose the reflection of the, the in the water uh the eye detail i could zoom in on this on this model and look at the eye detail and the processing done there to really make that stand out just that little bit of kiss of light coming through. I love it all, except burn down. <laughs> just burn down a little bit of that hot spot on the shoulder. That's that's a bit much. I think it could have been a little bit more of a smoother, smoother transi transition from, from that light coming from the top of the frame down to our model here. Uh, it's nice to show that the light is shining on the model, but just uh, burn it down just a touch right there on the shoulder, but I love this. It, it, this is another dreamy, moody feel that just sort of 
slides right into my wheelhouse of things that I would like to shoot and, and compose, even down to the colors are not necessarily booming in saturation or anything like that. It's sort of muted. And I love this. Nicely uh, done. Real, real quick before Don goes, Jane made it. So Jane, welcome. And Alistair Jolly of Smug Mug and Flickr and an amazing photographer. If you don't follow oh, Alistair, go find Alistair. Alistair. Uh, Don, what do you got? So uh, I love the connection with the eyes. And there was probably some level of post-processing here in order to bring, especially um, the, uh, the, the right eye, which is at the bottom of the frame, to be bright mm -hmm. enough that we can see it. And, yep. and I can't really see a light source around there that would be the cause of that. So if that's post-processing, then it's done in a really elegant, nice way in order to lift that out of the shadows um, without it being a distraction. So that's great. I love that. Uh, to Anne's point about the uh, the hot spot on the on the back, sometimes especially bright sunlight on fair skin can be unrecoverable, and so I get that. But what I would do in that case is I would uh, create a, a duplicate layer of the image, uh, circle around that and do a content to wear fill. And then using a healing brush, just kind of clean the edges of that really, really nicely to remove it entirely. And then take that layer and change its opacity down to like 10 or 15%. Because what that's going to do is it's going Beautiful. to uh, recover the area to give a little bit of texture and light in there where there was none to recover to begin with, without it looking like there's a heavy amount of post-processing uh, being done. Because if you just try to recover it when there's nothing there, you get a gray blob rather than a white blob. And that's just ugly. I would never do that. But there are other ways around that to recover things that have completely, um, you know, uh, gone, gone away from, uh, from the traditional techniques, the mist falling down and the light coming down through that mist to that one spot is so critical, I think, to this image. And I think that it is so wonderfully done. There's a little bit of motion in that mist. You can just barely tell that those little droplets are spreading down, which kind of gives me the idea that they're falling very, very lightly. And that it gives uh, a sense of atmosphere to the overall scene. Uh, I see what looks like a rock wall in the background and a plant, and I have no idea if this is natural or if it is staged or where this is, but it does feel cohesive. And that cohesiveness to this overall scene should not be understated because this is clearly a staged shot to some degree. I'm not sure exactly what elements are in your control and which ones are not, but it looks like they are all in your control. And so compliments to the photographer for getting that to all come together. Yeah, yes. I, I agree with everything that they've said. And so here's the thing. When I first saw this shot, literally a name of a commercial product, a perfume came to mind, Nature's Mist. Uh, this reminds me <laughs> of a perfume ad. Great shot for this type of treatment that you've got. I like that I can see the mist. Like Don said, you can see that the mist is actually moving. I love that. The Okay, the bright spot on the back, that definitely needs to be fixed if you want to take this image up to the next level. You know, luminosity masks would let you recover that, put the color back in, leave, get some texture back in. There's a lot of ways that you could do it. The main thing is <clears throat> do it. That's the main thing I want to get across. Mm -hmm. There is there is something, however, here that is is almost like a mismatch to me. I'm not sure if she was dirty and rolling in the mud and is bathing, or if she, or if this is nude model photography because there's dirt all over her, and I would remove that before the shot, or I would clone it out after the fact clean up all the dirt spots on her leg, on her knee, on her hip, make her more attractive in this because what you've done with the pose, the way her little finger touches the water, the angle of her face that I can see both eyes, the hair being wet, there's so much positioned right that that is a mismatch to me, as is the string. So I'm not sure if... It's nude photography and she walked out with clothing on and that's, it, it almost feels like it's not supposed to be there. If it was an actual bikini, that would make sense. Shorts, that would make sense. Heck, it could be sweatpants. It would, it would seem intentional. There's something about just seeing a string along her back and hip that is, just seems off to me. So you got to commit one way or the other, but overall... 
I love what you created here. And I love, I love the way your mind works with all the posing and everything. Again, I keep going to that hand. That was not accidental, I don't believe. I think mm -hmm. somebody took the time to say, wait a minute, lower your hand, put just your little finger in the water. And it was really smart that you, that you did that. Uh, real quick, I got to call out Casey said, it was her shot with the log in the waterfall. Said, thanks guys and Steve, you don't want to see what's behind the log. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, again, Casey, hey, thank you so dirt. much for playing along. Uh, the, the dirt that you're talking about in there, I, yeah. I'm, I'm totally with it because of how the hair yeah. is and because of how the background is. The background the hair ties it together. Is. Yeah. And I, I almost, uh, and along your, your same thoughts, maybe there should be more dirt, like maybe dirt on the arm that's going that into the water okay. as if it's right. possibly on to be washed off. This seems <laughs> accidental and forgotten. Again, it's the word I used is commit to it. Either go mm -hmm. that she's dirty and bathing or go that she's a model. But this feels yeah. in between to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Good uh, idea. Next shot. And Don, if you want to go first on this one, this one is called Exit. All right. Um, uh, light dot left side of the frame. Going to point it out right away so that we all I see it. I got nothing and, now. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we all saw okay, it. Okay, so <laughs> we, we all saw it. And so just calling out the elephant in the room here. I, again, uh, that, <laughs> I hate to sound like a broken record, but, uh, you know, solve that. Now, uh, architecture shots and, and lighting and framing, they're all very key. And, uh, and and I like the fact that you've got enough balance on the left and the right, which is really wonderful. And the fact that you've got a person that's walking through the door frame that we can see the entirety of uh, at the bottom, I think is a really nice accent to the image. And without that, the image would have a lot less life. Um, yep. and, uh, and and so, but, but to that point, uh, it's just the one person walking in there and, and this could be just um, random uh, occurrence of somebody walking. Now, if, if that were the case, it would be almost impossible to plan for somebody walking into the frame on the doorway below. Um, but I think that would be a really cool combination of, of having a, an additional element within the frame. People interacting with the architecture um, is always a beautiful thing. I wouldn't want anybody walking along the staircase, though. I think that that has to stand those curves and those lines just as they are, nothing interacting with them and the human element to be a very small component within this space. Um, again, looking at the edges of the frame, at the very, very top, um, you can see a tiny little bit of white jutting uh, I guess it's uh, the, the end of, uh, or the railing is about to start going horizontal. I would shave a couple of pixels off the top of the frame just to remove that. Um, and uh, in the bottom, I mean, obviously that's where you're standing. You're in that doorway or you're you know, somewhere near that doorway. I don't know how high the camera is up to get this particular perspective. Um, but there's part of the door frame on the right side and a little sliver of it on the left. And, and I kind of wish that there was a bit more of a balance. I don't mind that it being slightly off more on one side than the other, but the left side of that little golden sliver of a triangle is a bit too small for me. Uh, and I'd want that to be a little bit bigger in, in how I kind of uh, wiggle the frame around and how I view things uh, accordingly. But um, in terms of architecture, spiral staircases are always a win. They can be badly done, however, because just like a beautiful landscape that you can pull up a point and shoot and take a snap of doesn't mean you're going to walk away with a fantastic image. So uh, you've played with the lines and the shapes really well here. And the entire framing overall just feels like velvet. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's just soft and welcoming and, and very matted. Uh, and, and, and I think it works. I, I just, I, I like the shot. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's so much, I, I'm going to word it as potential. This shot, this location has a ton of potential and you captured what was there. I don't know that you made fine art. There are some things that you could do that would turn this into fine art for me. It's off balance, which I like. I don't mean that it's angled. I'll get into that in a minute. It, it is off balance in the fact that the, the large staircase coming to the right seems to go out farther than the, the one going down. And yet it is symmetrical. I like that. But you need to commit, if you're making fine art, in my opinion, at least, you need to commit to it. 
So first of all, it needs to be straight. What Don said about the doorway at the bottom, there's a small sliver on the left and a large triangle on the right. Well, that's because the picture is not straight. So you, if you look really close at the wall around the stairs, the wall is literally closer to the bottom of the frame on the left and farther away on the right, and the top balcony is tilted. This whole image needs to be rotated so that that entry at the bottom goes straight in and the balcony at the top, the left side of that landing, is vertical. The triangles at the bottom, I kind of wish I didn't know there was a doorway there. I kind of wish I didn't see those triangles. Now, if they were symmetrical, that would be cool. As they are here, I actually would clone that big one out on the right and make it solid red or whatever you know tone that is. Same on the left-hand side. I'd, I'd rotate this and I'd make it just come in from solid color. Would be kind of cool. Uh, the color temp here is a mismatch too. That's the lighting that's in the room. You captured what's in the room. But the staircase on the right is getting color from the wall. The staircase on the left is much warmer and matches the, the doorway that the person's going into. And that, that mismatch to me is uncomfortable. That may be what you want, but to me, it doesn't make it a stronger image. I would use a brush and I would even out the tones of the staircase left and right. I love the fact if it's not posed that you got the, the, the purse or briefcase or whatever it is away from the body on the person. Really, really good that you did that. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, Ant, what do you got? I agree with you. Um... I was sitting here thinking maybe I would clone in the door on the left, the bottom left bottom of the frame, or like you said, just, just get rid of it. But it's definitely off center. My, my eyeballs are saying I need to just rotate it just a touch clockwise, uh, just to try to get it straightened out a little bit more. And boy, mixed lighting is a pain in the butt <laughs> to, to, to try to shoot. Yeah. And this shows here that that's 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 mixed lighting all day long and where to whatever this facility is, they're, they're not using the same light sources there. And so, yes, use an adjustment brush with a very, very low flow, probably 10 to 15 percent, no more than 15 percent flow and just change that temperature to try to match it up with the the light down on the lower floor. Yeah, I agree. And you know, you could just abandon this color temp altogether, take it into Photoshop, do a layer on the stairs and put any color you want it on there. Uh, there's yeah, a lot of ways that. to deal with this, <laughs> but I think all three of us are kind of saying, by the way, white dot, just in case nobody noticed it. Um, there's also, <laughs> there are also some black things on the wall on the left. I'd probably remove those, but commit to the fine art of it. Make this shot amazing because it has the potential in my opinion at least, to be an amazing fine art shot that I could picture you walk into a giant law firm and this is mounted on the wall behind the receptionist, right? Yep. Tons of potential here. Please yep. work this shot well. Uh, there's just so much that you can do with it. All right, let's do our final shot. And Ant, you are the guest, so you get to finish up. And the name of this shot is... <laughs> SOCF D71K 1998. <laughs> I love those names. <laughs> All right, this shot here. This one, I. This is a tough one. This is a tough get. I've been working with the local high school here doing some content for them and shooting on these, these high school fields or small school fields at night is really, really difficult because they're not lit as well as a college, a major college facility is, or a major professional facility is. It's just not lit as well. So you're gonna to have to do whatever you can to capture fast motion with whatever camera you're using. And a lot of times that means cranking that ISO up. And in this image, uh, this, the photographer cranked the ISO up to, what is it, 8,000? Yeah, 8,063. 8, that looks like an automatic setting there. And they're shooting at one eight hundredth of a second to try to freeze the frame at aperture F4. Uh, I'm not familiar with the lens used here uh, on this Nikon D7100. Maybe that's as low as that aperture could go at F4. But I can tell you, F4 is not enough in these situations. It's just 
you're going to end up with the noisy grainy shot here. If you look at number 14's face, you can see even without zooming in, there's no detail there. It's just a limitation of the camera versus the um, uh, environment, if you will. So I have some some sympathy for the photographer because this, that's just a hard shot to get. You're going to need to have a upper echelon lens. You're going to need something that's going to be doing F2, uh, F2.8 at least um, to do these types of shots. So uh, get you another lens. Keep that same camera body. That camera body is going to be fine, but get you another lens so you can get some more light captured and um, so you can freeze that action. But I, I uh, yeah, and I look at one more thing here. The the leveling of it. Uh, if you look at the grass, the grass is it's not quite level. It's a little bit of a a fall off going to camera right. So rotate that image. Try to level that horizon a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so I'll go second on this one, and everything Ant said. Okay, that was it done. No, fantastic sports <laughs> moment. Right. This is when you're talking about sports. You want a moment. This is a moment. So to the photographer of this, you get it, right? You understand what that moment is. And so that you know, I want to say this because I chose this shot specifically for a reason. This photographer has some images in the critique pool that I almost picked. There's one, some volleyball players going up to block a spike, a dunk in basketball, and they were really, really nice shots. And awesome. I specifically chose this one because, uh, to the photographer, I don't mean any anything bad here. It was the weaker of the bunch, and it's a critique show. So I wanted to find an area where people could learn and we could mention things that would help. So, Teachable moments for everybody, exactly. not just the photographer. What you did here for an action shot is so much right. There's separation, right? The back person barely intersects with the elbow. I wish they didn't, but other than that, good separation there. Separation yep. of the, the middle and the right person. The hand coming up in front of the face doesn't connect with the face. Even the ball has space all the way around it. So much that you did. In fact, it's the rule of odds, even. You've got three people. There's a lot going on here that's really, really good. But... I tell people all the time, ignore the noise. It's like I'm a broken record. Ignore the noise, ignore the noise. We all worry about it. We're photographers. We pull it up in Lightroom and go, ah. But I tell people to ignore the noise. I could go deep on that subject all day long. But this is an image where, okay, you went 8,000 so that you could get 800th of a second at F4. If you could have gone F2.8, maybe you could have lowered that a little bit and kept your shutter speed or just gotten a faster shutter speed, either one. However, in this particular case, the noise that you did get, your processing accentuated. So the middle player wasn't sharp to begin with, even at 800th of a second. I don't know if it was a tracking or focus issue. Really, the sharpest thing is probably the back of the green jersey. But you globally sharpened it without using any kind of limitation on where that sharpening would go. So for example, in Lightroom, there's a masking command. If you hold down the Alt or Option key as you drag it, it turns uh, black and white, and you can see the areas that will be sharpened. It should have been dragged up to probably 70 or 80 so that the faces, the back of the jersey would not, the legs and arms wouldn't be sharpened. Effectively, what you did was you shot high ISO, high ISO, you got a lot of noise, and then you sharpened the noise. Yep. And that is making it stand out like mad. Level the shot, like Ant said, the grass is really obviously not level. I'm not sure if you wanted the girl in white to be level, but she wasn't in real life. Level the grass. But the biggest thing to me is just selective processing. There are things you do global, and there are things that should almost always be selectively brushed in or put in with a mask. Selective processing in many ways is always better. All right, always, always, always better. Uh, Mario, by the way, said, as David Bergman says, crank the F and I ISO, which he definitely does say that a lot. Uh, Don, what do you got? <laughs> All right. Well, a couple of things based on the same uh, train of, of thoughts, really. The, the, the noise, 
is an issue, but the, the grain structure is larger than I would normally see in an image like this, which tells me that the image has been punched in a little bit. Cropped. You know, you've cropped yeah. in in order to uh, in, improve the the focal length. You know, to approximate maybe your approximating a 500 or 600 millimeter lens because you're throwing away half of your pixels uh, to, to get closer to your subject. And I get the reasoning for that. Um, you know, I've recently been using some tools uh, to increase the resolution of images and uh, something like this might benefit from uh, Topaz. Uh, the Gigapixel AI has a low resolution mode that tends to clear up noise while enlarging things very nicely. And so there's some tools out there that you might not have been familiar with. And by no means is that the only one. There's a lot of companies that are are uh, employing these uh, AI technologies in order to, to get you better results from what you already have. So check those out, I would say. Um, but the lens, especially wide open, uh, and especially on high contrast edges, you're getting a lot of chromatic aberration. And I can see some of it's been cleaned up. Uh, along the uh, the jersey of number 14, you have uh, her right shoulder camera left, is uh, there's a little gray fuzzy line on the outside of that jersey. Now, normally that would have been when you've taken the picture, it would have been magenta. And you can see it's slightly magenta on the other arm. The reason why I know that is because if you look at number three in the background, you've got a green halo green. around their socks and, and, their, uh, and their outfit. Now that's not because they were wearing a green stripe on the outside of their outfit. No, that's, that's chromatic aberration. So uh, that's another thing when you're using a telephoto lens wide open and it's not the creme de la creme of the most expensive optics you can buy. It's just something you're going to have to deal with. Um, now, to me, that becomes distracting. Now, how do you deal with it? Well, there's a number of ways you could deal with that. Uh, I deal with it photographing snowflakes, oddly enough, uh, because it's got a high contrast edge on a workhorse of a lens, but an old one, um, the Canon MPE 65. And so how I deal with that is I take a, a layer of my image, a duplicated layer, and in uh, uh, using a camera raw filter in Photoshop, I crank the color noise reduction to 100. I put the detail down to zero and the smoothness up to 100. Just crank it as far as you could possibly do. Maybe even double that, uh, just you know, run the filter again. And then using a layer mask, paint it along just those outer edges that are problematic, showing you that color that you don't want. And that color is going to go away. It's going to blend in. Yeah, again, you have to use a fine brush to just go around those green edges, but you will fade it away because it's not affecting the entire image. I don't want to globally do a color noise reduction, which is going to mush together colors where I don't find a problem. I'm just going to apply that to those edges that are glowing green or magenta that shouldn't. Um, and, uh, to go in and put that little bit of fine tuning on an image like this can be helpful. I don't think anybody mentioned that that soccer ball is perfectly framed between those two players. You know, there's a little sliver of space on either side. It makes it feel really dynamic. Like it's in motion between those two people, which I really like. Um, and, uh, and the overall framing I think is, is great. And, uh, and to touched on the idea that these shots are hard and even with the yeah. best equipment, it's still hard. Still hard. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hard. so I should I should commend the the photographer for getting at least this. And yes, the, within those technical limitations, uh, without going to brand new hardware, which we all lust after the latest and the greatest hardware that's beyond what our budget currently allows for. Um, no then comment. there. <laughs> there are software tools that can help as well. And some certain things involved in the post-processing that can sort of bridge that gap a little bit, but, uh, but, but I do, I, I, th I think it's a great shot. The framing between all the players, I don't know if it could have been better. Well, and, and again, I want to reiterate that what I said at the beginning, your, your, your subject separation, the fact that they, none of the players really touch each other and their space all the way around that ball, uh, is this is the moment it's the framing it's everything that you want but you've got front focus and the noise issue and all of that can be dealt with in a number of other ways by the way i do want to mention a couple of things first of all robin uh chimed in and said that stair shot would make because of the color mismatch and stuff it would make a nice black and white which yeah. is which none of us mentioned and that that was a really good one uh, Gary call. said on this one, nice job of getting low uh, ground needs straightening, but I think this is a peak moment. Yes, definitely. Again, Mario brought up David Bergman's uh, crank the F and I ISO, which is so true. 
Gary made a great comment. And that is, if you notice the ISO, you missed the shot. Arguably as well, true. Um, and then uh, Romy said, uh, Topaz Denoise, and the comment was in there back up here too, Romy. Topaz Denoise AI, sharpen AI on the soccer photo. Uh, the focus is the near girl, but should be the center player, which we, we discussed. So again, mm -hmm. and Steven said uh, that he also shoots on a low light field himself. So thanks for all the tips on this type of stuff. Well, so, I, and you, actually, I just th th thought of one more thing, Steve. Um, yeah, on that shot? Is that, uh, oh yeah, on, on the shot, one of the reasons why the noise is as prevalent as it is, is because it's selectively in the image. What I mean by that is the majority of the background of the image is black. So black that it doesn't have a noise profile above the noise yeah. ceiling uh, of, so in, in that case, if I were to be processing an image like this, um, then I would let those blacks have a little bit of detail, not because there's anything back there to see, no, but just so that the noise in the black is still prevalent. Right. And that would make it blend a little bit better with the noise that we see in the subjects. Well, and again, we've, we've touched on this a couple of times tonight and it deserves another mention. And that is selective processing, understanding that not every area of a shot has the same issue as another area of a shot don't just global everything. Uh, Romy said yeah. a Nikon Z9 would have been great here. Yeah. So would a Canon R3. <laughs> well, sure. You know, but again, yeah, cost becomes an issue, but overall great selection of shots tonight. I don't uh, know if a Z9 would work in this, if it's still a lower end lens though. I think it would because you've got, you've got such great high ISO performance. Um, I think it would have solved a lot. And the, the 3D oh, yeah, tracking in the true. Z9. Uh, yeah, their ISO is. It, it wouldn't solve the chromatic aberration and, and it wouldn't solve no. all of your issues. Um, but, you know, it and you this a is. Better base. It would get you a better foundation. Yeah. True. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Anything uh, you guys want to say before we close out? Thank you for keeping this going, Steve. We really appreciate you. Oh, Indeed. I love, I truly love doing this. And today was just a weird day. So it was, yeah, long story. Uh, okay. So with that in mind, Ant Pruitt, people can find you again, where give your website, give your, your Twip stuff, your Instagram, all of that. So folks that are still here or watching this after the fact, go follow Ant, subscribe to him everywhere. Where can they find you? Find me on the socials. I am Ant underscore Pruitt on both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, check out my personal projects at antpruitt.com as well as YouTube. That is youtube.com slash antpruitt, no underscores there. And then, of course, my my employers, twit.tv. My show there is hands-on photography, helping you be a better photographer and post-processor in about 15 minutes at a time. The website is twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash h o p. And Mr. Behind the Shot, congratulations on 6,000 subscribers here. Ah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And by the way, on Hop, there's a series that Ant did. Don did one. I did one. Alan Hess did one. A bunch of people have done one. Uh, it's Quick Tips. And you've had some, name some of the other people that have done tips. Well, in if addition to think, having I, I you guys with this on goal, <laughs> in addition to having you guys on, I've had Jefferson Graham, I've had Mr. Rick Salmon, I've had Vanessa Joy, Tasha Gaines, uh, Tiba Jefferson, um, Loretta Houston. Man, that story. Wow, she was so inspirational. Um, and I'm talking with uh, Mr. Scott Bourne. We were talking about bird photography earlier. So um, I'm going to see if I can get Mr. Bourne on the show as well. And you did, you just did a... Uh, uh photo walk with Jefferson Graham. Do you know when that's going to air? That will be airing on January 11th, I believe is what he said. But then, yeah, yeah, that was Mr. Jefferson Graham. We did a photo walk in downtown San Francisco and had a lot of fun. Um, it's not your typical photo walk. So make sure you're tuned into his YouTube channel or just follow me on my socials because I'm going to share it out too. It was a lot of fun and pretty uh pretty interesting sights down there yeah i did one of those here in in my hometown of riverside and and uh had a fun uh, jefferson's a great guy so don komarechka photo geek weekly uh you've got other podcasts too that we haven't mentioned are those coming back 
Yeah, inside the lens, I've got a couple of ideas uh, that as soon as I'm fully set up here, I would love to explore. That's the podcast where I do a, a deep dive onto a particular topic with an expert on that topic. And uh, that will never have a set schedule. It's just whenever uh, it comes up and it'll be in the Photo Geek Weekly feed uh, when they do. But I mean, even here, I'm still setting up like I can I can turn my camera sideways and you can see my office is largely empty right now. There's a table with some stuff and some setups. I've got some Gerber, uh, Gerbera daisies there um, that uh, I'm prepping for a shoot for. But, uh, you know, we're still in setup mode. So uh, when everything is completely configured and and this space is filled and, and everything else is, uh, you know, easy to get to in terms of, you know, just grabbing a camera and throwing together. I want to do a video series, a, a macro tutorial series. No idea where that will end up, but um, I'm, I'm itching to get back to that kind of, uh, I guess, creative um, educational stuff where I show everybody my secrets. I love doing that record, so much. So it, what's that? Ant? For the record, I'm, for the record, I'm going to request to have the two of you guys on my show again for a follow up. Okay. Um, cause Fantastic. things have changed, you know, it's, it's been a little while since y'all have been on and there's been a lot happening and, you know, I'm, you, you with your move and Steve is slowly getting back into concert photography and boy, I know that's different. So yeah, it's very <laughs> I definitely different. want to get you guys back on. Anytime, oh, we'd love to, you know, Anytime. There, there's a certain synergy between all of our different platforms here. And, and I love that. That's what, and our audience, uh, you know, it bounces back and forth between all of our platforms and wherever we are. And, and of course we encourage that. So, uh, I also want to thank everybody for, for being here today, listening to, to this and to photo geek weekly, which again, is coming back very soon. Photogeekweekly.com. All right. And to close out a couple of uh, quick comments, first of all, Stephen said, thanks again for another great show. Gary has an applause sign, which I want one. Cool. Uh, Mario said another great episode. I met Mario at David Bergman's workshop in Vegas. I just, it still blows my mind. It was so, so great. Uh, Casey, thank you again, guys. Drake, enjoyed the show as always. Good to have Ant with you tonight. Yes, very good. And I love this one from Romy. Uh, I gave up Perry Mason to watch this, but that's okay because I usually doze off during Mason and wake up in the Twilight Zone, which I love. Uh, Evelyn, very helpful show. Feels like something like community when we're hunkered down again. That is the goal. Like, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but really, honestly, for me, these guys are my friends. <laughs> so to be able to do this show with them and you guys as a community, I mean, really, honestly, it's, just an absolute joy. A couple things I want to let you know about, though. These critique shows, they're only available here on the Behind the Shot YouTube channel. They're not in the normal podcast feed. So if you are watching on YouTube at any given point in time, me, Ant, Don's YouTube channel, any of that stuff, if you like the content that you see on YouTube, whatever the creator is, head down, past the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, hit subscribe, hit the bell, bang all the buttons. You're not going to break anything. And it really does help us to get subscribers and to get thumbs up and things like that from a, from a, from a YouTube point of view and the way that they run things. If you want to participate, well, that was weird. My screen just went black. If you want to participate in this, all you got to do is go to the Flickr group, uh, flickr.com slash groups slash behind the shot. And join the group, submit your images there, and use the Flickr tag BTS Critique. That puts them in the pool. That's kind of like your way of saying, I'm willing for you guys to pick this shot and use it in the show. All the photos that you do have to be in the group and have to be tagged. If you want to reach out to me, you can do that. All you got to do is uh, find me on Instagram or Twitter. I've kind of abandoned Facebook. It's at Steve Brazel or at Behind the Shot TV on either one of those platforms. And again, if you want to find the website for the normal shows, it's behindtheshot.tv. My personal site, site is Steve Brazel. It's like Brazil, but it's two L's. Thank you, everybody that stopped by live. We had a lot of people here tonight watching live, and it's 10 p.m. Pacific time right now. It's quarter to 12. Don just woke up. He's going to get coffee. Ant and I are probably going to pass out or get a you know, dram of scotch or something like that. So everybody, no thank comments. you for participating. <laughs> if you see this after the fact, Please try and join us live sometime. This is Behind the Shot.